This is the Demystifying Mental Toughness Podcast, hosted by David Charlton, and you're listening to this podcast to help you build your own mental toughness, or so that you can support other people or your clients better. Either way, you will learn more about developing this plastic personality trait that all but guarantees that you will perform better and lead a more prosperous life. Hi and happy Easter. I hope you go on to enjoy your Easter weekend. I'm taking a break from work this week as the episode is released and really do hope that I return fresh and energised after spending some time with my wife and boys. And of course, taking some dips in the North Sea as I continue my quest to embrace the cold. That's right, you may not be aware if you haven't listened to the podcast before, but for me, I went into the cold certainly a a cold tub anyway, every day in March from the temperatures sort of varied from 12 degrees all the way down to two degrees. And one day it was particularly stressful and traumatic. I went on a retreat in Scotland with an excellent Wim Hof instructor, Mark Hume. And this really led me to think about the podcast and how stress actually does affect us, how we deal with it, and in some cases, how we don't deal with it. So as a result, I thought I'd share a short bite from one of my first podcast episodes, number two, with Steve Judge. This episode, it's one of the most downloaded episodes from the podcast. Steve's story is hugely inspiring, and how he turned his life around from a serious and really traumatic car crash, where both of his legs were crushed, he nearly lost his life, He went on to to learn to walk again, and then eventually succeeding as a two-time world champion in paratriathlon. Enjoy listening to Steve's words of wisdom and story. I had a a massive adversity in my life that changed it it in a big way. I was driving down the outskirts of Sheffield, and there's a lot of rain on the road, so the the roads are a little bit skiddy, and my car skidded. And it spun and it crashed into a, a, a pole. And that, that, that crash bent the car in half. And within that crash, both my legs got crushed. So stuck in that mangle of metal, you know, I couldn't get out. And it was a horrible feeling for me. Everybody coming to save me, the paramedics, the ambulance, the um, police, the fire brigade. You know, it took them, I think it took them about over an hour to cut the car apart piece by piece and eventually dragged me and my legs out of the car uh, into a nearby waiting ambulance. That mercy dashed me to the nearest hospital, the Northern General Hospital in Sheffield, where they they pretty much, you know, they, they saved my legs, but more than that, they saved my life. And it was a very, very traumatic time. My mum, my brother, my sister were, were called, and they were told that they might not see me again. They didn't know whether I was going to survive the operation, but I clearly did. You know, and eight hours later, I was... I was awake in the hospital bed, but looking down at my legs, which had both been trashed, um, is, is hard, hard hitting. You know, and it was around that time when my surgeon came around and uh, he, he told me that this, the operation had been successful, but because of the severity of my injuries on both my legs, there's a high possibility that I may never walk again. And um, I think when somebody gives you information like that, it's very much a fight or flight. And the, the flight being, I could just roll over in bed and just give in. And the, well, the opposite being, I, well, I can remember being really angry, really angry and furious that somebody had the audacity to say that to me. I, I guess that's the fight inside me. I don't like it when people tell me that I can't do things. Uh, when you have something so special, some, something that you take for granted, like walking and standing and walking, to have that taken away from you, to have that stolen from you is a horrible feeling. And at that point, I, I realized that I was ready to fight. And I say that because deep inside I did, but I had absolutely zero energy and my legs were trash. You know, I'll try and explain, but my left leg had been ripped apart at the knee. So the four ligaments that hold your knee together, like the big rubber bands, they'd been ripped out. Um, my right leg had been partially amputated. What that means is that uh, in my calf, in, in the bottom bone, the, the tibia bone, four inches of that had been knocked out and thrown away. So they, they, they seized it together and put a big metal cage around it. But my leg was literally four inches shorter than my left leg. The massive difference. So I was told it was going to be my responsibility 
to twist nuts and bolts in this cage, slowly stretch my leg out a millimeter a day over the course of about 100 days to get it to the right length. That's what I had to do. And I was just like, are you, are you kidding me? Uh, this is this is crazy. And they said, well, it's not usually recommended. You know, we usually recommend only two inches, but, you know, yours is four inches. So, you know, do your best kind of thing. Now, you know, doing all of that, going through the rehabilitation, getting my leg to the right length was, was hard enough. Um, but then there were consequences on that. Even when the, the leg was the right length, there was a gap in my bone. There was no bone. It's very hard to get that across to people, even to myself. If you did an x-ray, there was just a black gap where there was no bone. Now, there was a calcium line. And the more, and I said, you know, how do I grow the bone back? You know, I was thinking you just drank lots of milk or ate lots of cheese to, to grow bone. And they said, no, Mr. Judge, what you're going to do is you're going to start using your leg. That will encourage the bone to grow back. I said, well, like what? So, well, you've got to stand on it. You've got to walk on it. I'm like, but there's no bone in it. <laughs> what do you mean? And they said, well, you're going to trust the cage. The cage is holding it all together. Trust the cage, stand on it, walk on it, and the bone will grow back. And again, that's a massive mind over matter thing uh, to do, to, to stand up, to put weight through your leg, even though you know you've got no bone in it pushing the weight through the pins in your leg, uh, seeing the blood trickle down your leg as you're putting your, your effort in the pain, going to the pain and everything, it was really hard. But there were even more consequences because I'd stretched out my whole leg. Um, everything was tight. Uh, all my tendons had shrunk in a way. Uh, and then I stretched them out. So everything was really, really tight. So imagine my, my right foot, uh, my toes were really clawed. Uh, because the, the you know if you touch the bottom of my foot, oh that was just so painful. I'd go through the ceiling. But more than that, I couldn't get a straight leg. So my leg, my right leg, was bent because the tendons were so tight. Now I was dealing with other things in my rehabilitation: the left leg, the right leg, growing it, and everything. And when I went to the hospital once, they said, "Mr. Judge, your your right leg. Can you straighten your right leg?" And I said, "Oh, not very well." And they went, "Right, you really need to get that straight because if you don't get your leg straight." You can't weight bear on it properly. In fact, if you walk on it, you'll be walking with a limp for the rest of your life if you don't get your right leg straight. You think, oh, are you kidding me? You know, I thought the big thing was getting my leg to the right length to grow the bone back, to get the toes right. Now you're telling me I've got to get my knees straight. There's always like something else and something else. But that's what I had to do, working on how to get my leg straight. And I imagine as well, you're going through a complete emotional roller coaster during that period of time as well, to, and you, you would have to deal with that. Do you know what? It was just, it was, it was hard. It was tough times. Uh, I was looking at my diary and, um, uh, recently, and there was about a month, there was an entry a month later after the accident that said, look, today's been a good day because it's the first day I haven't cried. I cried every day and I cried with a question going around in my head, why me? Why me? Why is it happening to me? There was clearly no answer to that. But there's some really down, down days. You know, if we were going through down days at the moment with coronavirus, I feel you're on a bit of a tightrope. Sometimes the slightest thing that's negative in your life at the moment, you could just fall off that tightrope and it's all doom and gloom. I was like that for, for month in, month out, uh, doing my rehabilitation. I was absolutely so committed in doing the rehabilitation because I had my goal of standing and walking again. But my, yeah, my mental health really did suffer. Uh, and especially when you get knocked down all the time, there's always something else and something else and something else. You're like, oh, just give me a break. This is, this is crazy. I was, I was finding it hard enough just to sleep let alone do all the, the inflicting pain on myself, get my right leg straight. The only thing I could do was sit on the floor and push down on my knee, trying to get it straight. Uh, and I'd do warming up exercises. I'd push down, I'd hold it down. Do you know what the first thing I did uh, when they said I've got to get my leg straight? First thing I did as an engineer was I went and bought myself a protractor so I could measure it. Benchmarking is always so important. You want to set a goal, benchmark it. So I measured the angle of my knee, saw how bad it was, took a photo of it, then started the physio. Day in, day out, pushing down on this leg, uh, doing sessions. Did about three sessions a day, and uh, and I, I started doing a graph as well, doing a chart. I remember you know going to the physio and they said, "How are you getting on with your leg, Mister Judge?" I said, "Oh, I'll show you. I've got a graph. Look at this. It's like an Excel spreadsheet." They go, like, "Wow." The thing is, I wasn't doing it for them. I was doing it for me. I needed to see the progress that I was making. And after three months of doing extreme physio, sometimes I was doing more physio than I should have done, which did not work. But I still I was trying anything and everything. After three months of doing this physio, um, the results were that it hadn't worked. My leg was still bent. It was, it was a horrible situation to be in. The, the fact that I'd done all this time and effort, I couldn't do any more. 
Um, and I just, I was out, I was out of, of ideas. And what I had to do was, you know, ask for help. But um, be- before that, I was, because I was in such a low pay, and we were talking about this before we started the podcast, I was probably at the rock bottom. When we talk about the wave of resilience, we're talking about like some adversity hitting you. You you have the shock and denial. You have the anger that brings you down. You have the sharing, which is the moaning part, really. The rock bottom is when you can't get any lower. And I, I, I stopped doing my physio. I started sulking. I started not washing, not shaving. I was just a waste of space, really. And I can remember lying on the sofa, looking at all my physio equipment that was untouched. I remember looking at my charts, my Excel spreadsheet that had been not entered because I'd given up, I'd given in. And I just thought, I looked around and I just thought, I don't want to be this person that I've become. I love listening back to that that episode. I'll never get tired of listening to it, I suppose. And episode two, where I got the snippet from. You know, feel free to dip back into the archives and check that episode out. The details are in the show notes. Steve's journey has been incredible and hugely inspiring. Today, he's the author of two books, Gold and Don't Lean on Your Excuses. I'd suggest you check those out too. He's also a sought-after motivational speaker. So yeah, check him out and go on and have a fantastic Easter. If you enjoyed this episode of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with David Charlton, do check out my website, sport-excellence.co.uk and my online sports psychology resources. Sport-excellence website has essential resources for anyone looking to build their own mental toughness or the mental toughness of their athletes or teams, or if you want to achieve peak performance more often or optimal functioning. The Sport Excellence website has everything you need to keep moving forward and thrive. So go on, head over to sport-excellence.co.uk to find out more.